Why do you want to be a wildlife conservationist? How did you become a wildlife conservationist? Are you Vietnamese? Why are you here? Why don't you work in your own countries? Those are the questions I've been receiving over the last 10 years since I started my journey as a wildlife conservationist. So David Attenborough once said, all children find nature fascinating. This is a picture of me when I was four years old. I found this tiny little green worm on the beach, and I was so fascinated by him. I decided to watch him for hours, and my mom said, the open space is not safe enough for the worm, so I pick him up and move him to a safer place nearby. But growing up in Vietnam doesn't mean I get to see nature as it is. I see a lot of the ugliness of the illegal wildlife trades. I saw monkeys chained up for sale on the streets. I see birds crammed up in cages. Back in the 1990s, the Vietnamese government allowed people to keep bears for bear by farming. And the neighbor next door, they also have a bear. As children, we were so curious. We want to see how a bear looked like. We've never seen it before but they keep our curious eyes away by having a giant cover in front of the bear case all the time. But one day, when I get back late from school with my friends, I heard some grunting noise. I heard people talking about bear. So we were tiptoeing next to the gate and peer through to see what's happening. We saw a giant bear lying on the floor, the people surrounding him. We saw some weird machine next to the bears. And later on, I learned that the type of machine people use to locate where the gallbladder is. And then we saw a man with a giant needles. He held the needle up and he stabbed the bear on the chest. The moment that happened, me and my friend, we screamed our head off, we ran, we scared, we terrified of what we saw. We don't know what bear by farming actually is or what it means back then. We were children, but from what we see, we know it means cruelty. And that evening when I get back home, the thing that I saw, the noise I heard, the smell that I feel at the times, I just cannot never forget it. And I make a promise to myself and to the base that no matter what happens, I will do everything I can to change this, not to just to bear, but to any other wild animal in Vietnam. But it was very difficult. I didn't know what conservation is. I asked my parents, I asked my teachers, and they told me, you are a girl, you're not going to the forest. You are also Vietnamese. Conservation is a kind of job for white men in the West. They are rich. That's how they go to the forest and save these animals. People like us, we would be a teacher, an engineer, or work at the bank. I wasn't interested in those options, not at all. I tried to do everything I could to learn and to gather information about wildlife conservation. But what my parents said was true, though. Back then, and even now, there's not many books about wildlife, not many books about wild animals. They are all in English. And my English back then was terrible. I almost failed English at school. So the only option I have was to learn English, learn its hearts, and learn it well. I also saved up my lunch money so that I can go to the cafeteria nearby to use the internet and find out if there are any NGOs in Vietnam working in wildlife conservation. I write emails to them, I write letters to them. As you can imagine, have an eight-year-old girl writing to you, asking if they can be volunteer at your NGOs. <laughs> exactly. A high chance you say, no, go away. <laughs> but I didn't give up. I keep being persistent. I write to them every day, every month. I write to them years after years. When I was 14, I get a letter back, and they say, OK, you seem to be determined. If you want. <laughs> If you want, you can come over and help us out with one of our education projects. And that's how I started to have my first step into wildlife conservation world. I was also very lucky that when I was 18, I get to go and study in the UK um, to be a real wildlife conservation scientist. I get to go to amazing places like the Madagascar and study the lemurs. To me, back then, wildlife conservation, it's just about saving the animals. It has nothing to do with humans. And that's exactly what my project is. I get to stay in the forest for three full months, following the lemurs, observing them, studying them, recording their behavior, their habitats. That's all I care about, and that was amazing. A few years later on, I get to go to Kenya, Opezita Conservancy, and I met this guy. 
He probably is one of the most famous rhino in the world. You might have heard of him, or at least of his death. He's Sudan. Two months ago, Sudan passed away as the last northern male rhino in the world. I get, when I was in Kenya and they told me I get to see him, I was so excited. Even though I was a registered researcher, I have to go through three other security checks in order to come and see him. But the moment I get to see him, I was overwhelmed with sadness. He was there, all by himself, in these big places surrounded with guards, taking care of him to make sure he wouldn't be killed. He's a wild rhino, but he didn't exhibit any of normal behavior that you see in a wild rhino. He got used to captivity. He was born in Sudan by the time he was two years old. He was taken to Czech Republic for breeding programs. The breeding program was a succeed. He was father of two other rhinos. And just five years after he was taken away from Sudan, his whole subspecies was wiped out of Sudan and of Uganda. Now, when I got to see him, he was one of the last seven northern wild rhinos lived in the world. And he doesn't know how to forage for himself. He gets used to being fed. He sees mud. He doesn't know how to have a mud bath. And the worst thing of all, that we cannot release him to the wild because he wouldn't be killed, for sure. In places like South Africa, Kruger National Parks, every single day, there are three to four rhinos get killed. In the full moon, when people are being romantic and say the full moonlight is so beautiful, we conservation get terrified. We call it the blood moon, because there could be eight to 12 rhinos get killed in just one night. And so, with, his, with Sudan gone, his subspecies is definitely going to be extinct because of human impact. That makes me wonder, knowing about him and his story, what I'm doing is it make any sense. Studying animals in the wild and their behavior, looking at them, observing them, being in the forest is wonderful. But does it make any change? Did it help to contribute to the conservation world, to the practical conservations? The answer to that those questions came in the most unexpected way. When I was in Cambridge University, I got terribly sick. The doctor told me that I got cancer. That was terrifying. I was only 21 years old. And the whole time, I was planning to go to set up the luckiest camera trap survey throughout the whole of Vietnam to find out if we have any clouded leopard left in the forest. Over a year of planning and working and getting funding for that, and the doctor told me that there's no way you can go back to the forest. Forget about it. You have to change your plan. You have to do something else. So I remember that very morning, I was sitting alone on the hospital bed. I was sad. I was reading some kind of report about the illegal trade of rhino horn. And my doctor, he came and he looked at me and he said, Chang, this is so dangerous. Why do people in Vietnam and other parts of Asia use rhino horn for medicines? Rhino doesn't have any medical effect at all. And if you use it for cancer treatment, cancer, the most important thing to treat cancer is the terms. If we lose the optimum terms, there's nothing else doctor can save them. I know to you, you're a wildlife conservationist, you care about saving these rhinos, but what about these people? It's so important to save these people's lives as well. What he said just struck me in the head. What he said was right. Wildlife conservation isn't just about saving wild animals. It's about saving us human life in the long term as well. Terrified that I might die anytime soon, I do everything I could within my power. I set up an organization in Vietnam based in Hanoi called Wild Act, where I give opportunity for young Vietnamese like me, to learn about practical conservation, no matter how old they are, no matter what experience they have. All they need is just a passion. I also moved closer to home when I worked in Mozambique and started a program looking into the illegal trade of elephant ivory. Three years of working, doing undercover work, training the local capacities, working with the police in the hope that we would be able to crack down some of the lucky shots in Cambodia. But we learned that, actually, all of these big shops are being operated and protected by high-end government officer corruption. What are we going to do? As NGOs, if we want to be vocalized and speak out, not being careful, then they would kick us out of the country so easy. 
we have to change our tactics. We have to work with the consumer. I want all of the consumers to know the story of these brave African rangers I met when I was working in South Africa. I was very lucky when I was 22, 23, I met one of the rangers from the anti-poaching unit in Kruger National Park. I was fascinated when I saw him. He was wearing, you know, he was fully armed, he had gun, he had granite, and he go into a forest to protect elephant and rhino. I just look at him and I say, you are amazing, you're my hero. What you are doing is amazing, you're so brave. He just looked at me and he sighed and he said, I actually just gave up my job two months ago, not because I don't love it anymore, but because every single morning when I get up, I have to fight within myself. Am I going to shoot at someone today and be a murderer? Or am I going to be shot at and be killed? What he said is a reality of what is happening now in the conservation world. What he said is what the dangerous that all these rangers are having to face every single day. Over the last 10 years, more than a thousand rangers were killed while on duty. Last month in April, when I was in the Netherlands, in a safe place, receiving an award for my conservation work, six rangers in Congo were killed when protecting elephants. My colleagues in Cambodia got killed as well because of some illegal loggers while he was working in the forest. So, I want all of these people, everyone, all of us, my Asian friends and my Vietnamese peers, to know that in order to save elephant and wildlife, what it takes. I want them to know about the story of these brave rangers. I want them to know about the poor African people living near the national park and protected area, being given gun and money, being used by syndicate and criminal, push them into the forest to go hunt elephant and rhinos to supply the market in Asia. I want them to know what it takes to save elephants and, and rhinos. It takes lives, many, many animal lives, many, many human lives. When I was working in South Africa, I also do undercover work with the police over there. And my friends in Vietnam, they love to hear the story when I get back. One of their favorite stories that they make me tell them again and again was when I posing as an illegal wildlife trader. As you can see, I'm a Vietnamese and a woman. It's so easy for me to go in, talk to them. They don't feel afraid of me. They show me rhino horns, they show me elephant tusks, pangolin scale, whatever I ask for is there in front of me. And I was wide up with hidden camera and recorder by the police. So after we collect all the information that we needed, after days and days of working, we decided this is the time for the arrest. That very morning, I came in to meet the dealers. I made a deal with them. I told them that it's going to require a huge amount of cash. And as a woman, I don't feel safe bringing all those cash here to such a dodgy area in Johannesburg. So if you want to make the deal, you have to come to my place. And luckily, they agree. So I got in the car with them, with three armed criminals, with elephant tusks, with rhino horns, with all of the other illegal products. And while trying to talk about something as normal as the weather in Africa to keep myself sane, believe it or not, my hidden camera ran out of battery, and it started flashing and flashing and flashing and flashing constantly. I was so terrified. If they see it, they can just shot me right there in the head. I was so terrified. I didn't know that my heart can beat that fast before. Quickly, I grabbed my hair and pulled it over, and back then my hair was longer, so it managed to use it as an other layer of the cover. And luckily, the hidden camera stopped flashing. We get to the place safely. I walk out of the car, reached up my hands, scratching my right ear, and that the signal to the police that now everything in the car come for the arrest. The arrest happened. These three guys, I am standing here speaking to you, they are still in prison. Thank you. So people often ask me, why do I do what I do? Why I'm taking such risks? Why being heroic? Well, I believe that I am still like that little girl seeing the little woman worry for his safety, so I move him to a safer place. Working in the illegal wildlife trade, dealing with criminals, there's always dangerous, always uncertainties, and always difficulties. But someone out there has to, to take the risks. And if that person happened to be me, 
then I wouldn't do it without hesitation. Because I believe that how conservation works. That every single one of us has to be proactive. That's how the world goes round. We're not sitting here and waiting for someone else to take the risk for us. I hope that when you see wildlife product being sold in the market, whether it's rhino horn, pangolin scale, elephant tusk, you will think of me, of my story, and the story of the rangers and many, many other people who are willing to stand up for our wildlife, refuse to give up, no matter how difficult and how dangerous it is. I believe that there is a wildlife conservationist within every single one of us. So I urge you all here today to join hand with me to support my book. To no matter who you are, what are you doing, how old you are, use your talent, the resources, and your voice to speak out for conservation. Conservation is not just a career; it's not the job. Conservation is life. The food that you choose to eat, the clothes that you choose to wear, how you choose to go from one place to another. All of that will contribute to conservation, and we have to work together to make sure we humans will not be the only animal left on Earth. To make sure that there will be a future for our nature. Thank you.